It's really been a pleasure to be with you today and to have the opportunity to be here in the Kingscliff Church. We're going to be talking about some difficult subjects right now. We're going to be talking about what we're facing right in front of us. Are you willing to listen to it? There's some material that we need to know as Christians about what is about to happen and how God expects us to prepare. God's Word says that the nations will be trembling with fear. Now, fear never comes from God. Every time you find Jesus coming around and they're scared, he says, fear not, it is I. Right? Fear not, fear not, fear not. God is not a God of fear. He's a God of peace and joy. But when he suddenly shows up, we humans have a tendency to be scared. Even if God shows up suddenly in our lives and gives us an opportunity and, and we're trembling in fear because it's different than we've expected. As, as the disciples saw Jesus walking across the water, they were fearful. Why? Because they'd never been there before. And what about when the waters have started coming into the boat? Wouldn't you be fear, afraid if it looked like you were out in the middle of, of the Lake Galilee and this tempest was out there? It wasn't just a normal tempest. This was a demonic tempest. This was a tempest that was seeking to kill Jesus and the disciples right along with him to destroy the early church at the very inception. This was, this was such a terrible tempest. I would, we could call it the perfect storm. And in that storm, Jesus was sleeping like a baby. The disciples were scared to death, and finally they screamed out, Lord, help us, for we perish. And Jesus woke up. All he did was reach out and say, peace, be still. And instantly, the water that he had created, the winds and atmosphere that he had created, instantly obeyed. I mean, can you imagine the, the atoms saying no to their creator? How could a piece of water say no to the very creator that brought it into existence? No, they can't. So Jesus stood up and said, peace, be still. Instantly, it was still. It, it must be in incredible to be in the presence of the creator of all things. I can't wait. I used to, I used to think that I, you know, I, I don't own a home on this earth. But my, fa my favorite type of house is a log cabin. And I see some beautiful log cabins, and I, I say, oh, oh, Lord, in heaven, can I have a log cabin? <laughs> and I dreamed, my log, I was designing my beautiful logs and all kinds of wood and everything. And finally, I read the statement, <laughs> Adam was so distressed and sad when the first leaf fell off of a tree. And if, if Adam was sad because of the death of a leaf, can you imagine Adam cutting down a tree? Would Adam cut a tree down? No. Kill a tree? You're crazy. It's like killing an animal. Some of these trees are thousands of years old. And you're going to... Would you want to kill a 6,000... Or I mean a 4,000-year-old tree today? Wouldn't that be considered a crime? If you go to a state park and you see these big old redwoods that are supposed to be over 1,000 and you just started cutting on it with a saw, what would you do? You'd end up in jail. They would be outraged from the people. Can you imagine in heaven killing a tree? So I finally realized there's not going to be any log cabins in heaven. And then I began to study about the bride of Christ, and I realized the bride of Christ is going to live in the temple. And my stupid human nature said, David, you'll never get to have your log cabin. You will, if, if you allow God to to prepare you and you submit to God, you might end up even having to live in a building the rest of your life, the temple. And for a while, I was almost disappointed. I, I'm not going to have my log cabin. We're so crazy, we humans. We don't, can't even imagine the glory to live in God's presence. God is offering us a glorious, permanent residence in His very presence. And I want a log cabin. Stupid David. So, as we discuss what's coming on the earth, we have to realize that God has beautiful plans for us, and the way we see things is totally different. And we're just going to have to trust God on this one. He's going to bring us to experiences we don't even understand, and we're going to say, Lord, I don't understand. Trust you anyway. Th that's, that's really the bottom line. He's going to take away from all of us, eventually, everything we have. 
in order that we might learn to trust him more. But I give you two choices. Would you rather give it up voluntarily or would you rather have it taken from you by force and violence? How would you rather give it up? Voluntarily. <laughs> voluntarily. Wouldn't you? Oh, absolutely. And the way God is doing that today, he's presenting opportunities to God's people to be a blessing to God's work. And only you and him know that. You and God, in private prayer, in Bible study, in the spirit of prophecy, will understand what God is doing, and it will be a great privilege for you to say, Lord, not, nothing of what I have is mine. Just tell me how to manage your things. And as soon as God says, I want part of my house over here. I want my house over there. I want you to sell my house. I want you to give away your car. I want you to do this. And always say, yes, sir, yes, sir, yes, sir. And as you do it, you see, oh, Lord, thank you for the privilege. I'm glad nobody took it from me. I gave it away voluntarily. It's beautiful. And finally, when you run out of things, and the very next day they come to take it all, and you say, sorry, don't have anything too late. You came here 24 hours too late. <laughs> huh? Aren't you going to be happy? Whereas the neighbors over there, they try to keep it, and they, they lose it by force. And then they say, if only I would have known. That's why last day event says, if we ask God, he will tell us when and how to sell our things. But if we don't ask him, he won't tell us. And we will be allowed to keep our things. And eventually, we, they will come down like a great mountain to crush us. Oh, I can imagine the agony of people that say, I had wealth. And if only I would have known. I w now I've lost it and I've never done anything. If only. What a terrible agony of soul. You are responsible for, that, for those resources. And you lost it without ever saving any souls. This is a terrible thing. Now, in, in Matthew 25... We have the story of the, the talents. And before we open God's word, I ask you to invite, to pray, invite you to pray with me. Let us bow our heads. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for being with us throughout this series. We have enjoyed so much your presence, the stories of your faithfulness. And now, Lord, as we discuss the last day issues that are coming upon the world, we pray that you will find us faithful. We want to hear those words, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Please teach us today. In Jesus' name, amen. In Matthew 25, I just want to quickly outline what we have here. It starts in verse 14. A man traveled into a far country. He left five talents, two talents, and one talent of gold, a lifetime a lot of money, left it with his servants and left to a far country. Didn't say where, probably Australia. Took him a long time to get there by ship. That's because they didn't know it existed in those days. And they, the ship got grounded here and it took a long time to get back home. But eventually he made it home. And when he came home, when he came home in verse 19, after a long time, the Lord of those servants cometh and reckoneth with them. And he says... Give an account thereof. The first servant came and said, While you were away, I, I took your five talents, I invested them, and now I have ten talents. The master smiled and said, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. For he that is faithful, and little will be found faithful in much. You will find that a little later. And I will make him a rule over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Then he, came, he that received two talents, verse 22, came and said, Lord, you, thou de deliverest to me two talents. Behold, I have gained another two besides them. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Now, this is not even having to do with money, by the way. This has to do with souls. You see, God already owns all the money. Does God, does God want gold? Can you give God gold, by the way? How can you give something to, some, to something that he already owns? Imagine coming up to Bill Gates and say, I want to give you a computer. <laughs> the latest operating system, I want to give you a copy. He would, he would just laugh at you, right? Who do you think I am? Ignorant. You can't give something to somebody that already owns it. So, so the, the, when we're talking about money, money is not even the issue in this parable. 
God already owns all the money. He owns all the money you have. He owns all the money Bill Gates has. He owns all the money that anybody in any country has. Money is not what God needs. He doesn't need our money. Now, the only reason he allows us to manage it is to teach us to enjoy saving souls. If you take your money that God has given you, and you save souls with it, and you continually invest in souls, then you're getting the message. It's about souls. Money is just kind of a, a piece of paper, currency, that go, that gold, just a, just a mineral that's out there. It's all over the place. It's pavement in heaven. 